provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 38, Section 20, real-time public participation and comment can be addressed to the Planning Board utilizing the Zoom virtual meeting software for remote access. This application, this application will allow users to review the meeting and send a comment or question to the chair via the question and answer function submitted. Text comments will be read into the record. For those of you joining by phone, press star nine. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. A copy of this recording will be on the city's webpage. All votes will be done via roll call to ensure account accuracy. Um, Mr. May, do you just want me to review the agenda um, and announce that we are? Yes, please. Okay. So um, tonight we have just three board members. Um, Larry Hassan. Here. James Weenie. Here. We also have um, Fire Chief Williams and, you know, Rob May, the director of the planning department. We are short one uh, board member, so we unfortunately are not going to be able to hear two um, items on the agenda. So if anyone is here for the return to ZBA for property 134 Armiston Street, we, will, we are unable to vote on that. We're short board members. And also for permission to return to ZBA for 3355 Westgate Drive. So if anybody is intended for those two, they will not be heard. Um, I apologize for that, but state law has us um, in a bind that we have to have a certain number of members present in order to hear a return to ZBA case. So again, apologies. We do have on the agenda definitive subdivision property 53 Cypress Drive, lots four, applicant George Heichel, George Asak, representative ET Engineering. Okay. Did we have any other business before we get into that? Um, yes, Madam Chair, we do have uh, a couple of things. There are no new A&R or lot releases before you. Um, however, um, next on our agenda, we have a presentation by the city of a uh, master plan that we are preparing for the Lovett Brook or the Brockton Heights area of Brockton. So this is the area around Good Samaritan Hospital. We are working with a grant from Mass Development called the Site Readiness Grant. And that is helping us to analyze the market um, potential, <clears throat> pardon me, for the redevelopment around the hospital area. Um, if you drive by um, Good Samaritan, Medical Center, you'll notice that there is a lot of vacant property or underutilized property. And uh, we're hoping to take advantage of that um, because of its proximity to the highway to see some redevelopment in that area. And we were encouraged by some work that we have been doing with MIT and the Mass Life Science Center to um, evaluate the potential for life science um, development in that area. So that's creating some higher wage, um, higher skilled jobs and um, other uh, interesting uh, amenities in the area. So I would like to introduce Emily Ennis uh, of Ennis and Associates, who is our consultant working with us. And uh, we have a rather large project advisory committee that uh, represents uh, some of the landowners and residents and um, uh, business owners in the area, but um, we have been uh, working towards a our first public meeting, which is October 14th. It also will be on Zoom, and um, we'll be pr discussing the plan in more detail. This is kind of a sneak peek of that plan, and we wanted to get the, the planning board uh, up to date. I should say that as part of this presentation, um, because we're in advance of the public meeting, we are going to take written comments in the Q&A um, from the public at large, and hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions at the 14th, um, but we will be taking um, board questions um, live, and hopefully we'll be able to answer those for you. So, Emily, um, let me hand this over to you now. 
Great. Thank you very much, Rob. Good evening, planning board members. It's a pleasure to be in front of you tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but I just want to emphasize that where we are is in the middle of this process. We've been doing a lot of background research. I'll touch on some of that tonight. Um, we've been uh, communicating with the project advisory committee that Rob mentioned earlier. And uh, we have tonight to show some scenarios that we're talking about um, just to illustrate what could happen on the property. They are not development projects. This is not a final plan. What we're really looking for on October 14th is input into some of the things that we're looking at. So I'm going to share my screen with your permission and just show you uh, where we are and what we've been talking about and looking forward to some of your questions. So as Rob mentioned, this is the, the Lovett Brook, Brockton Heights area. I'll show you in a minute or two what the plan looks like. Uh, he talked uh, a lot about um, who's involved in this conversation, but just to say that in addition to myself on the consultant team, we also have RKG Associates and Ty and Bond. RKG is working on the market analysis, and when we get to a scenario development program, will be helping us with the pro forma for that. Ty and Bond is looking at the environmental, the traffic, which has been a source of public comment in terms of the survey and uh, responses that we received and uh, other components of the development. In addition, Halverson, which is a tie bond studio, has been doing a lot of the landscape architecture and graphics work on this. In terms of existing conditions, as Rob mentioned, we started with a project that MIT had done on life sciences in Brockton as a whole. And because of the location of Good Samaritan Medical Center on this site, started to extrapolate information from that project, uh, which went over several presentations to the city of Brockton. They also looked at the city of Worcester, started extrapolating that into what could happen on this site. Uh, as part of that, we did a lot of work. Uh, um, our, my colleagues at RKG Associates, uh, Eric Halverson and Brian Gridley, on the market demand, not just in Brockton, but in this specific area. Emily, yes. Can I stop you for just one second? Of course. A housekeeping moment. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier. Because the two return to ZBA cases, which is Armiston and Westgate Mall, uh, or Westgate Drive, we will not be able to hear those. We are continuing those to Tuesday, November 5th, um, which is our next uh, date. And um, that information will be in the meeting minutes, um, which uh, we'll type back up again when Pam comes in, comes back. I apologize again for that. Um, those two cases will be continued to the fifth. Thank you. Not a problem at all. These things are important. Um, so the market analysis uh, delved deeply first into the life sciences and then into, and particularly in biomanufacturing and other me medical manufacturing. We also took a look at some uh, associated manufacturing. And then of course, housing demand, office demand, retail demand. Uh, one of the things that you'll see from the site is the variety of uses on here. In terms of life sciences, Brockton has a strength in the healthcare industry already. Um, and that's not just its hospitals, but also the STEM program at Brockton High School, which I believe is the second uh, most prominent in the state. And so, you know, there's a talent pool that we're looking at. Uh, in looking at life sciences across Massachusetts, across the board, obviously you see R&D and lab very much in the Boston area and is expanding um, to the west and to the north of Boston, uh, as is associated such as manufacturing. You're not seeing as much in the southeast. I was on a conference call recently with banker and tradesmen listening in to some uh, regional experts discussing this. And all of the discussion was the South, or sorry, the West and the North. And so we really see uh, an opportunity for Brockton to become a regional leader, but that's going to require partnerships with educational institutions. It's going to require marketing this site and the opportunities to brokers and really showing them and uh, to companies what this site could be. 
And then finally, this idea that it, Brockton already has a number of assets in this area that could be leveraged. When you get to see the full report, which we will uh, we'll talk about that in the next steps, you'll see that uh, the projections based on previous trends don't show this picture. And that's because life sciences is relatively new, especially in the Southeast corridor. Um, and so the projections that we see are based on past trends and the extrapolation of those past trends rather than a um, proactive future marketing opportunity. So let me introduce the site to you in terms of the existing conditions, having talked a little bit about the high level. Uh, you see Oak Street here. This is Route 24. I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Um, this is Route 27 coming onto North Pearl Street and then connecting at Oak Street Extension. Um, the colors, and we'll talk about those a little bit more when we talk about the development, but they show the mix of uses on the site. We have a lot of retail and restaurant here. The yellow are scattered single family houses, the purple, the medical center, Good Samaritan Medical Center and associated medical offices. And the blue is Harbor One Bank. And finally, the white is a small church here. It's interesting looking at this. We have in uh, some of the materials that we prepared for briefing packages, uh, the original plans from the 1930s of what this site would have looked like. And in fact, Oak Street came all the way down here. There were a lot of cross streets here. Obviously, 24 and 27 didn't exist. So uh, the parcelization, which we'll talk about a little bit, is a little, very different from what you might see in some of the other more regularly parcelized areas of the city. In addition to that, we also, I'm showing a selection here, but we looked at environmental considerations, both in terms of Lovett Brook. Uh, actually, let me just call it back. This is Lovett Brook right here. So it bisects the site and has some associated wetlands. It's mostly channelized. There's a culvert down here, and it actually runs underneath this building here, which has a laundromat and a 7-Eleven in it. So we looked at the environmental considerations of the brook and also were there any hazardous uh, releases on the site. We took a look at impervious or paved surfaces, what that might mean in terms of the health of the brook, in terms of stormwater management, the surrounding environmental justice communities, demographics for the area, both in terms of residents and in <laughs> workforce and also uh, traffic transportation and circulation. And in addition to this sort of quantitative existing conditions analysis, we've had since May or uh, late May, early June, we've had two uh, or three surveys on the website, one for residents of the area, one for employees of the area, and one for businesses of the area. And those are still open. And we're hoping that people are, and we'd see that people are continuing to make comments on those. So for anyone listening in who fits into those three categories, we would welcome your comments. So I mentioned that we're looking at scenarios. What we're trying to do is take, okay, given the existing conditions on the site, given the uses on the site, given the market demand, given the market that we see in the future, what the potential is, what could fit on this site? So what you're going to see in a few minutes is those working scenarios of how we see um, the possibility of development over a five to 20 year or even more period. So again, I want to stress that these are conceptual scenarios. They're not projects. They're certainly not going to happen anytime in the near future, but <clears throat> they're a way for us to get additional public comment. So in terms of the existing land uses, as I mentioned, restaurant and retail, medical office, the single family pieces, office and church, there's also the footprint of former movie theater on site, and that, that will become important later on. As we think about the possible scenarios, uh, we've got the first two are phase scenarios. So you'll see 1A and 1B. 1A is something that could happen in the next three to five years, maybe. And we're looking at some sort of biomanufacturing here, office lab here, potentially supporting what's going on at Good Samaritan Medical Center. Here where we currently have single family homes, we could see a market for mixed use development. 
that mixed use development could potentially have retail and restaurant on the ground floor um, and residences above. There's quite a bit of multifamily across the street. Um, the amount of retail and residential in here, at least some of that could fit onto the mixed use site on that ground floor. Um, so there'd be a way for businesses who wanted to, to move into a new building. Um, if you're looking at something phased like that and say a three to five year period, maybe a little bit longer giving permitting needs in a 10 to 20 year period or 10 to 15 year period, you could move those businesses into separate uh, restaurant pads. There's currently three business, uh, three restaurants in this overall area now, and the remainder into a mixed use. You could see the mixed use in 10 to 15 years expanding along there and adding additional manufacturing. These two buildings here are gas stations, and we don't in this scenario, don't necessarily see those changing in 10 to 15 years. And again, these are options for discussion. The other thing that we could see happening is as these buildings are shifting around, you'll note that um, that allows, for example, Lovett Brook to be opened up uh, where it's currently existing under uh, the two businesses in that building here. Um, by opening it up, that allows the restaurants to move over and have outdoor dining, which has been hugely popular in the pandemic, to be right on a um, on the brook that has been revitalized with walking paths in through this area. Now, again, conceptual, but what we're trying to do is imagine the amenities that could be on the site to support not just mixed use residential here, but also the existing multifamily, the existing businesses here and future businesses here. In other words, creating something that's an attractive amenity for a residential neighborhood, as well as attractive for new employees and employers in the area. So, 1A and 1B you see as, as moving sort of forward over a multi-year period. The next two scenarios I'm going to show are alternatives for almost a full build out. The likelihood is something like that wouldn't happen within say the next 20 years, maybe the next 15 to 20, maybe beyond that. A lot of that is very determined by market conditions. But what we're trying to do at this point is get a sense of the maximum developments that could fit on the site and the components such as the parking, the layout of any improvements, not just to the interior of the site, but in our work over the last week, we've been looking at improvements beyond the site. How would those all work together? And critically, given some of the feedback we've heard on the surveys, what would that level of development do to the traffic um, as it exists today? So scenario two, you can see the restaurant pads shift a little bit, the manufacturing stays in this corner, a little bit more mixed use, and then starting to add office up in this area here. Um, you see that again uh, in scenario three with even more office up here, a little bit uh, reorganized manufacturing, different manufacturing types here. Um, again, this is an exercise to see if this level of development volume were to happen on site, what would that allow us to do for the public amenities? And what would that allow us to do in terms of traffic improvements on here? Right now we're holding that all the same. Uh, currently, team members are working on what the different development scenarios do in terms of the different improvements. We hope to show that in much more detail on October 14th. And then finally, just as a high level overview in terms of implementation, we are looking at this as an urban renewal plan. The downtown, the Trout Brook area already have urban renewal plans. We're looking at a similar sort of piece to allow for the public infrastructure improvements to happen to support the private development. Again, over at least a 20 year period. Um, this, I mentioned the footpad uh, of the original movie theater, which is right about here in this uh, picture. You can see there's an awful lot of parking, an awful lot of impervious surface, not much development. There's a little uh, strip of um, uh, restaurant and retail along here. This is the um, uh, building, the front of this is Frank's here. Um, the car wash uh, is over here, prestige car wash is down here. And then 
Um, you see a lot of technical terminology about blighted open area. This is state legislation, but really it talks about a substantial change in business or economic conditions, that it's unduly costly for the private market to intervene or an abandonment or a cessation of a previous use. And all of these would really apply to this lot. Um, I'll show you where it is in a minute. Uh, you can see here the parcelization I mentioned, how chopped up it is. Uh, Newland Avenue and Lindell Avenue, for example, are paper streets. They were never actually fully developed. And so all of these housing lots have no frontage onto an actual public street. In terms of Oak Street, uh, it was pretty much abandoned. It gives access to the single family home here and the back of the footprint of the theater. But you can see when I show you this yellow parcel here is the parcel of the theater. This used to be in common ownership that changed relatively recently. This was sold to another owner. These are calling out the, uh, in some cases, it's all of the residential parcels, but the, the landlocked parcels on the site. And so we're looking at those, not that any individual use is blighted, but that the um, uh, irregular parcelization, uh, these landlocked parcels meet that blighted open area by the state's definition. And then that allows the uh, city or the redevelopment authority to start working on some of these public improvements to support some of the private development. So with that, our next steps are, of course, the October 14th meeting at 6 p.m. It is Zoom. Uh, we are certainly hoping that we have plenty of people to join us um, to look at the scenarios. As I said, they're being further developed tonight. So they will. The, what you see on the 14th will actually be more advanced in terms of infrastructure and some of the other changes we've made than what I've shown you today as a preview. Um, we're going to have online comment for the scenarios. If people can't join us, they'll be able to watch the meeting on their own or view the presentation. And then we'll have the scenarios in a little survey monkey so people can submit their comments for two weeks. And then we're going to be back to you on the third to really go through the full report in much more detail. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. I don't have any questions, just a comment. I'm um, impressed by this and actually glad that somebody is overseeing or watching our untapped land in the area. So I wouldn't have thought of something like that. I remember that um, theater when it was open way back when and my dog's doggy boutique is over there. I've been two dogs now I'm going there for 20 years. So I drive by it often and it just sits there with trucks parked over there. So this is um, hopeful. I guess I have a question for you. Um, is the goal on Lindell Ave to open up those back um, unutilized lots for residential? Is that what you may have said that, but sorry, it may have been pa uh, past me. Not at all. I'm just going to um, flip back there. Uh, and I'm flipping off screen. <clears throat> so I don't make people dizzy. Um, so with Lindell Avenue, there's a couple of options. We've really been focusing the residential up here along Oak Street to match the, the multifamily on the other side. We so the idea is that, that sorry? Mixed use, we should say that it is mixed use residential over retail. Yeah, retail or restaurant, ground floor, residential, two or three stories above that, depending on the scenario we're looking at. Um, Lindell Avenue, we could see in a two or a three, maybe being opened up to support. You can see Office Lab here with parking or another office building here. One of the reasons this is um, put in a much later scenario is that the topography changes significantly up here. It's got great visual access to Route 24 that's popular for office buildings. Um, you only have to go down uh, route, the old parts of Route 128 uh, in Waltham to see the corporate signs and how the visibility is really helpful. But like that area, it's very steep here. And so the market's really not going to allow for development in the short term um, for offices there. But in the long term, we think it's possible and we want to show that as part of the vision. So as Emily was saying, <clears throat> We are hoping to um, phase this over um, several years. Um, both short and long-term goals are being established here. And the existing businesses that are on the site, we're hoping to incorporate them into the new 
redevelopment of the site. So, um, Madam Chair, you had mentioned your um, dog care facility. Um, certainly that's in a strip mall right now. It could move easily into, um, you know, in a second phase development uh, that is, you know, a, a multi-use multifamily with better visibility, I should say, on, um, on Oak Street. So, um, that was one of the keys for us was could we um, accommodate the existing buildings on site, the existing businesses, sorry, on site if those buildings were moved. And so part of the exercise has been if we create these new buildings, would they be able to um, hold the existing buildings? So, for example, those two red retail uh, restaurant pads I showed you. One of those could be Tommy Doyle's and the other could be Frank's, for example. Um, there's also a Chinese restaurant. They could shift around and maybe one's the Chinese restaurant, one's the other and something else. One, the third is in that mixed use residential retail uh, building. But there is the possibility of accommodating. Um, as I recall from the numbers, we should be able to, in most of the scenarios, accommodate all of the businesses that are currently on site elsewhere on site. They seem to be serving the neighborhood. There's no reason for them to move unless they want to move. Um, so there would be that space available for them. Hi, Emily, uh, Jim Sweeney again. I do know there's a, um, I guess a gentleman's club in there. Is that, uh, what, is that also in that plan to carry over? I mean, that's obviously a, an outstanding question. Yes, my understanding is that it was recently revamped um it could the space could be accommodated on this site uh i think whether or not it's uh grandfathered uh use now is my understanding whether or not that continues is part probably partly a matter for zoning law as much as for the development but i'm sure the business owner will want to know whether or not it's possible for him to at least in square footage wise continue um, and the answer would be yes to that. I, I would certainly let the city solicitor take a, a crack at that first. Yeah, but in terms of development square footage, um, the answer is yes. Beyond that, I can't comment. I mean, I guess, you know, refacing that business might, you know, the public might have some questions. Mm -hmm. I think that's a reasonable comment. Um, any other questions from the board at this time? I'm all set for now. Thank you for the presentation, though. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from the audience that I'm going to state publicly so that we can have a record of it, and then we will answer it at the 14th, meeting on the 14th, and that is uh, from Paul. Wants to know if you relocate the restaurants, what will be the pr uh, new price of the lots uh, or the rents for those lots. And that is um, part of that performa development is what we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. um, we hope to have uh, more information about that um, in the very near future. So thank you, Paul, for attending and for your question. And with that, Emily, thank you very much. My pleasure, uh, thank you all. Now continue with the rest of our agenda. So, Madam Chair, we have two street acceptances, uh, Roberta Ave and Harlan Terrace. Uh, I do not see a city councilor um, who's here to present those. Those are both in Ward 3. Um, you should know that... Um, we are a non-binding uh, recommendation, and uh, ultimately it's up to city council, but um, both of these streets, um, the planning department and the uh, DPW don't feel um, would be problems uh, if they were accepted. Did you say Roberta Ave in what, Terrence? Harlan, H-A-R-L-I-L-A-N. Yeah. Harlan. Harland, thank you. No D. So, all right. So I need a roll call vote. Well, we need a, a motion to accept. Motion, motion to approve. Thank Second. you. Okay, all in favor? Tony Gonzalez, yes. Larry Hassan? Yes. James Sweeney? Yes. 
And um, we have two other projects, um, again, that uh, we have to continue. Those are the return to ZBA. So our next discussion is the- um, Excuse me, Mr. May, three. sorry to bought, jump in. Um, do we have to do the minutes from last meeting? Does that have to be? That is a good catch, Larry. Thank you. Just look, I figured I'd get it out of the way now. What well, you spend one meeting as acting chair and look at you. <laughs> Tony <laughs> me well. <laughs> so did we all have a chance? Well, I did. Did you yeah. all have a chance to review the minutes from yeah. the last meeting? Motion and to approve. Second. Okay. All in favor, Larry Hassan? Yes. James Sweeney? Yes. Yes, from Tony Gonzalez. Okay. Larry, is there something else that I should bring up now or? No, no. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. May, can you just answer one of the um, abutters questions? Are they gonna be notified about the rescheduled um, meeting date for these return to ZBAs? Um, send out something in the mail? Meetings can, that are continued at the public meeting um, don't require new noticing. Um, they'll be, uh, it'll be on the uh, meeting minutes, on the recording, of course, and also um, on the next agendas. Okay, all right, thank you. So who do we have for Cypress Drive? Cypress, a zoo, I am moving you up to a panelist. Um, George Heichel, I'm moving you to a panelist. Is there anybody else who is on your team that I should be moving up? Here's not. I don't see anybody raising their hands at the moment. So Azu, if you uh, turn on your camera and microphone. Technical difficulties. Azu, are you there? George, you have your hand up. Would you like to unmute your microphone? Hey, um, Rob, Does, Azu, we then one minute. I just talked to you. Okay. Apologies to uh, those of you who are watching at home. And George, do you have two monitors, or two uh, microphones open right now? Yeah, I'm going to close one. Okay, thank you. Hello, good evening. Jack's laptop. Ah, here he is. Hi, uh, Rob. Sorry, uh, I was waiting. Uh, I was listening to the eloquent um, presentation by your Harvard consultant. And then, uh, not to give you TMI, but nature called on me. So, <laughs> yes, that is TMI. All right, then. Thank you. So, um, are we on to start now then? Yes, yes you may, sir. Thank you. Uh, am I able to share my files or are you sharing them? Uh, do you have yours? Uh, yeah, I can try if you give me the uh, authorization to. You should be authorized. 
Okay. Is it showing? Um, uh, Azu, let me share mine. Okay. Although, I'm having unstable internet. Yeah, I think that's how. Uh... Just like okay, is that sharing right now? Oh, oh you, okay, you. Rob, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, for some reason, I can't grab that. There we go. Okay. Yeah, Azu, does that work for you? I can't see what I'm looking at. Okay, uh, let me... Uh... Yes, yes, I can see that. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Um... Let me go back to your title page. Okay, thank you. So, uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, for the record, my name is Azue Tuniru, uh, representing the applicant, uh, uh, George Heichel, and the owners of the land, uh, Mr. Arthur uh, Cuspiel uh, Pulos. And I represented my plant, my office, ET Engineering Enterprises, Inc., 481 Bedford Street in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Uh, for the record, I'm the uh, registered land surveyor, as well as the registered professional engineer responsible for the production uh, of the documents uh, by my Ebul uh, uh, associate, Andy Sargent, and, and co. So... Uh, as you may recall, this project has uh, was originally filed um, back in 2000, uh, winter of 2020. And then obviously because of COVID and everything else, it continued to uh, get pushed forward. Uh, but then the uh, planning board, as well as the, the conservation commission that we recently filed a notice of intent with, uh, decided to retain uh, an independent peer review consultant uh, by the firm of uh, Beta Group. And so uh, we uh, have the project. Uh, Rob, if you, would, if you don't mind, my sheets consist of uh, nine sheets. So if you could go uh, scroll up, okay, right there. So this uh, sheet right here uh, shows the existing conditions. Uh, right up the uh, looking up the top of the page will be your north. So Cypress Street will be to the north. Rockland Street will be to the west. Uh, three hundred number number three hundred Rockland Street uh, and number fifty three Cypress Drive are the two properties that have been combined. And uh, so you can see the existing house um, right up to the. Uh, right up against uh, Cypress Drive, uh, that is number 53, and then number 300 is to the west. And so there is a wetland, an existing wetland system located to the north, uh, to the southeast of the uh, uh, subject property, but it's not actually in the property. Now, in the, in the, in the uh, city of Brockton, uh, the regulation extends the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission to 100 uh, from the actual wetlands area. And the Conservation Commission has a policy of uh, requiring that any existing, uh, any project be located at least 25 feet uh, from the uh, BVW. BVW standing for bordering vegetated wetlands. And so you can see on the existing land, the extended the 25 feet and the 100 feet. 
those little polka dots that you see, the dark spots that you see, and the test pits that we uh, excavated at the site in order to determine uh, the consistency of the material that we find, the in situ soils consistent with the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, maps that characterizes soils in the area. And so the uh, mapping that we did and the investigation that we did uh, verify and do indeed corroborate the uh, findings of the Natural Resource Conservation. Rob, if you could go to the next sheet, please, I would appreciate it. Okay, right there. So what you have is a, a, a four lot subdivision, which includes obviously the two existing houses, the one at number 53 Cypress Drive and uh, the one at number 300. Then we are creating two new lots. Uh, again, under MGL chapter 41L, uh, the idea of a, definite, uh, of a definitive subdivision is that you are creating a new roadway uh, for the purposes of gaining access to the new lots that you are creating, as well as the, uh, providing the legal frontage uh, for the purposes of zoning. Uh, so what you have is three lot number one uh, being the one at uh, Cypress Drive. Uh, Rob, if you don't mind, if you do, if you will zoom into that, that that might be helpful to me. Uh, I hope I can zoom. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, what we have is uh, so those four lots. And uh, the existing house at number 300 Cypress, uh, excuse me, 300 Rockland Street maintains its uh, legal frontage on the street. That frontage doesn't change. Uh, the, uh, it meets the uh, necessary, uh, the requisite setbacks. Uh, nothing changes there. Uh, the lot area uh, we have is 34,000. 503 square feet. That land area uh, exceeds the minimum required area for this district. And uh, it's in the R R1C district. Uh, so that we call lot number one. Lot number two will be the existing house in 53 at 53 Cypress Drive. Now, the uh, required frontage uh, that is prescribed for this area is 175 feet. And so the frontage that we are creating, uh, while the zoning ordinance requires that if you are at a corner lot, you have to have the, the requisite setbacks. Uh, however, you need to demonstrate that you have adequate frontage, at least on one road. Uh, we have in excess of 100 and uh, uh, in excess of 200 feet of frontage on Volix Way. So the new road that we are creating uh, is called the Volix Way. A uh, lot two will have well in excess of the required frontage on the Volix Way. But we are showing you by the dotted dashed red lines that indeed it will also conform to the minimum setbacks requirements for the for the district. Then below that, uh, between lot number two, which is the house on Cypress Drive, and the house on 300 Rockland Street, will be lot number three. That lot also meets the uh, requisite frontage and requisite area. The land space that we are creating for lot number three is 35,394 square feet. And then just below lot number three is lot number four. That also has the requisite frontage as 35,655 square feet. You then go uh, to number three, Rob. Next page. Yes, sir. The very next page. Sorry, your vocals are breaking up. So, sorry about that. It's uh, well, 
you know, I have a poor audio quality on my on my laptop. Combined with my accent, it makes for a no Schwarzenegger accent. <laughs> so, so what you have is uh, the what we call the grading. The grading uh, sheet it shows you all the proposed elevations. Uh, shows you the uh, required street with the uh, street trees showing that we are respecting the 25 foot no activity of a buffer zone associated with the uh, wetlands resource. And uh, for this project, <clears throat> we have two drainage basins, open drainage basins. Uh, the one will be almost sandwiched between lot number two and lot number three. And the purpose of that one is to capture your surface runoff from the existing abutting lands to the northwest of lot number three. And so that we have runoff unimpeded being captured by this uh, basin. And then uh, it also captures a couple of catch basins on the cul-de-sac. And then from there, it goes southerly, southeasterly to another drainage basin located on the east side of Evolix Way. And so this drainage has been reviewed extensively. We went through uh, two iterations, even though we, we stood by our work. However, because you, the board and the Conservation Commission hired an independent consultant to review it. We acquiesced to the uh, recommendations uh, because at the end of the day, those are the voices that the board and the Conservation Commission will listen to. And so kicking and they were pushing, we acquiesced to their requests and demands, if you will. And uh, there were an uh, extensive report and we addressed uh, every one of those uh, items uh, uh, to the letter. And they have uh, stated uh, 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 as such. Uh, they have left a couple of items to the uh, uh, one item that stands very clear. If you look at uh, lot number three and lot number four, because we are creating two new house lots, we've also proposed what we call infiltration recharge uh, basins on those lots to capture the runoff from the roof. Uh, so that if you look at num lot number three, thank you, Rob, right below uh, the proposed house on lot number three, you will see the uh, infiltration basin specifically for that house. And then on lot number four, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, proposed a recharge uh, uh, structure to the east of the proposed uh, dwelling. What a beta group uh, has uh, uh, left up to the board is to determine what the board uh, will require that a rich, similar, similar charge pits be created for existing house number two and existing house number one. Uh, I don't believe that we need to for, for the simple reason uh, that we, for the simple reason that we are meeting the city's stormwater ordinance requirements, as well as the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection regulations governing um, uh, uh, lot developments. And so those existing houses, we're not changing their character. We're not adding to them. And so uh, it will be rather a, a burdensome on those houses to require that they provide a roof uh, recharge uh, structures, albeit we already meeting the requirements of the regulations. So I would think that well, we don't need to. Uh, requiring that, it will be more of a cosmetic requirement. It will not attenuate runoff beyond that, which we've done. Now, the, the roadway has been designed 100% in terms of traffic uh, requirements, in terms of paved width, uh, the board 
your regulations require that we provide a 34 foot wide traveled width of pavement. That's what we have done. It requires that we provide uh, a, 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 a cul-de-sac, a paved area for vehicular traffic turnaround. We have done that. It requires that we provide sidewalk on both sides. We have done that. And, it, and uh, well, we have sewer. We're providing water. The blue line that you see in the middle of the road that is labeled PWU as basically the proposed water line. And then we have a hydrant right at the uh, terminus of the cul-de-sac, right between lot number uh, three and lot number four. And then we have a gravity sewer connection to Cypress Drive, but that gravity sewer terminates just below lot number uh, lot number two. And then we have what we call environmental pumps, E1 pumps, uh, basically the ejector pumps for lot number three and lot number four. Those will eject uh, sewage to the manhole uh, on a volley's way, right by where it says test pit number seven, where we did a test pit number seven in the middle of the road, uh, just below lot number two. And so uh, when we went to Conservation Commission, uh, they had asked that we uh, communicate with the planning board, perhaps given the fact that this is such a low volume uh, subdivision, we're only proposing two houses. Um, the uh, Conservation Commission, uh, and I happen to agree with them, but that is not uh, what I agree with the commission or not, is uh, uh, irrelevant. Uh, this board is the uh, regulatory authority vested with the uh, uh, our responsibility of determining whether a roadway meets uh, uh, its standards uh, for public safety, uh, in terms of fire apparatus getting there, uh, this is being typical of what the planning board has required. And so we have demonstrated that we meet those requirements, albeit uh, from an environmental policy standpoint, uh, we would agree with the Conservation Commission that perhaps a reduction of the uh, pavement width and uh, perhaps elimination of the sidewalk on the east side of Evolix Way uh, would uh, serve to reduce the runoff impact and uh, allow for the drainage, uh, that drainage basin to be moved uh, westerly and further away from the wetlands, albeit, albeit as it is designed and uh, verified by your consultants. We meet both the conservation requirements and planning board requirements. However, again, from an environmental policy standpoint, uh, I, I see the, uh, the, the uh, consideration from the Conservation Commission. The other thing I want to point out to the board is that the whole pavement will be collected through catch basins runoff and routed to an environmental uh, treatment unit. They call it a stump sector, which is one of the... Uh, water quality units uh, approved by the DEP and I believe the city ordinance, uh, stormwater ordinance consistent with the MS4 program does indeed uh, uh, acknowledge that um, storm septors are very good in clarifying runoff uh, born oil and grease and trappings and sediments before they get into the recharge basins. So I will suggest that this project uh, meets your requirements, meets the environmental requirements. Uh, the one item, one specific item that we have from the inception of the application process, uh, one thing that we have consistently requested of the board because it's on a hardship on the project, on the land, is that we don't control the northeasterly uh, end of our project. If you look on the westerly end uh, of an intersection, we are proposing uh, a radius, a properly lined radius of uh, 20, uh, 30 uh, feet 
but we are not providing the radius, the properly lined radius, and we are asking for a waiver. That is one waiver that we are asking for. It, it does not. And what needs to be pointed out, uh, Madam Chair and the uh, board members, that radius requirement, we can still propose the necessary monumentation to define the right of way that we are proposing. The, the radius granting the waiver of the intersection property line radius, not the pavement radius, the property line radius, waiving that requirement does not, by any stretch of the imagination, not one iota, not one scintilla, affect the operation of the roadway. The roadway as designed and configured based on the pavement requirements, sidewalk requirements, meets and exceeds our, even the mass DOT highway division stand for intersections. We provide an ample intersection radar for the radar on both sides for the pavement. So it is a property line information that the board normally requires, but in this instant application, waiving that requirement does not you know, derogate from the intents of your rules and regulations governing the subdivision of land in the city of champions. What I will also submit to the board, uh, recognizing that this board is not constituted as it was even a year ago, never mind two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. But I will submit to this present board that this, the, the planning board had historically, in similar instances, our uh, granted waiver of that radius. We're only asking for one sideline intersection radius, which does not affect the operation of, uh, of the roadway itself. And so whereas uh, the uh, requiring of uh, a strict application of that requirement puts an undue burden on the land itself, as the board, not necessarily this board as it is presently constituted, has historically recognized in similar situations, waived that requirement. And there's an ample project example where that was done. And uh, I've, I lived in, in the great city myself for over 20 years. And I recognize those roads and some of those subdivisions I will submit to you uh, uh, we're done by my office. And those roads, uh, we don't have any accident data that suggests that, oh, because the board waived a properly lined radius, uh, it, it created a, a hazard. No, that's not the case. And, uh, a, and incidentally, this is a very low volume, of, uh, very extremely low volume uh, traffic expectation from this subdivision. At Cypress Drive, it's a very good subdivision road. It's wide enough. It has a 34-foot wide, uh, 34 wide width as well as this. So uh, I will pray this board to cons uh, well, with the uh, 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 information presented to this board that indeed uh, we're granting the waiver for one intersection radius, property line radius, uh, will not derogate from the intent of your rules and regulations and uh, will not uh, uh, pose any threat or pedestrian hazard. And so I thank the board for indulging me, listening to me, and uh, I will entertain any questions or comments at this time. Thank you, Azu. Um, I will open this up, and I've seen this plan a couple times before, and I can't speak to what other boards have um, passed or not passed. I do want to go on record that Fire Chief Williams had to leave for a fire and he um, left a comment um, to go on record that he has an objection to the 53 Cypress 90 degree corner. So just so that's on record. Um, uh, he I didn't hear that. One. Sorry, Madam Chair, that he what? He has an objection to 53 Cypress 90 degree corner. So he sees an issue with that being a safety um, issue. 
So I wanted to read that onto record. Okay. And that issue was brought before us, the last, well, before me, that my board, fellow board members are newer, but this issue was there and it's still here. And I just wish there was something you could do about that. Um, does any other board member have any other input? I don't, I don't really have any other input on it, but, you know, based on what you had just brought up about that 90 degree angle, I don't, I don't see any way they, they could make it anything different because it's abutting, you know, that neighboring lot. So um, I'm just assuming that Deputy Williams has an issue with it because of getting the fire apparatus in and out of there. That's the only thing I can see on that. Um, can we just look at the um, the two new lots that you're proposing on the footprint? I'm just curious to know what you're proposing for a, a type of home. I don't know if that's something you could answer or maybe Mr. Heiko could. I'm just curious because they are strange looking lots, but we've seen a lot of them in the city. But the you uh, the you uh... I, if uh, Mr. Hackle may chime in, but I do believe that we are looking at our colonials uh, and the, because those are footprints for the colonial residences. Two okay. single family colonial homes. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, I, uh, I, I, I'm, 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 uh, I apologize that I was not uh, privy to uh, that comment from Chief Williams, but I uh, I am totally flabbergasted because the the intersection of pavements between the uh, Volex Way and Cypress Drive, uh, that pavement meets the uh, intersection requirements. So the pavement itself meets your requirements. It's just a property line comeback. So uh, even if we have that radius, it will not change. And, that, and it's very important to note that. Uh, if you look at that uh, design, the way the uh, radar, radar, we are providing the intersection radar for the pavement, okay? So uh, it defies logic to see uh, how when the pavement in, intersecting pavement layout meets your requirements. We're just saying properly line cutback. Yeah. Um, Azul, so... Uh, yeah, that's Chief all. Williams, I'm... I'm mm -hmm. he, he did put that, sorry, I didn't have a yeah. chance to read that. I didn't mean to side swipe yeah. you, but he did put that in the chat during the pre presentation for Love It, uh, the previous presentation. Okay. Um, but this was, this issue was brought up to you before and mm -hmm. it's to my knowledge and my understanding, it does not re meet the design requirements. It has to be not less than 30 feet tangent to the two lot lines. So it's not meeting requirements. Right, but that does not, that's, that's, and I agree with that. That's why we're asking for a waiver. And we have several, numerous locations where that's been done, and it has not inhibited or prohibited access. What, what the actual improved area, the actual improved pavement meets your requirements. And that is what we're looking at in terms of operation. Right, because 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 in that layer, right, you are requiring trees. So if I were to put the trees that you're required in that radius area, well, how then how then does that mitigate safety concerns? If in fact there's a safety, right, because you're not put, you you're not going to be in putting any improvement in that thirty foot radius. The improvement that we're showing you meets your requirements, and so it it it, it defines. It defies our uh, logic to uh, say that that would affect safety when, in fact, if I were to put that, you would also require some uh, uh, tree planting in that area. So that really uh, uh, blows my mind. But that's, you know. Well, a lot of, I'd like to say a lot of work went into this plan um, since the last time we saw it. What was it? A year ago? I'm just guessing. Yes. Now. Um, yes. A, a, a lot of work. The rest of it looks really good uh, with all due respect 
you were aware of that concern? Because it is, as you started with, you know, announcing what our responsibility is, public safety, this was mentioned when we, we last submitted this plan to us. And it's the same public safety issue is still there. So that's unfortunate. Um, hey, you're are right, members? you're right, Madam Chair. And, and I'll end with this. You're right. But if you recall, because I've, I've been party to this as my responsibility. When we first came to you, our intersecting pavement, and you can look at that record, the intersection, the design of the pavement didn't meet your requirements. This pavement does. I just want to put that in there. So, yes, Madam, it, it was stated back then, but back then we also not only requesting a wave on the cutback radius on the property line, we were also requesting a wave on the pavement. And we're not doing that. That's uh, and now I'll, 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 I'll leave that. That's well, right. thank, thank you for pointing that out. And I did acknowledge all the other work that went into this plan since the last time we saw that. Um, yeah, any other Madam comments? Chair? Yes. Madam Chair. Um, and and the, the document that's up on the screen right now really shows the uh, difference between the 30 foot. And I, can you see my cursor when I'm moving it? No. That's this different computer. Okay. So on the left side of the screen, you see the 30 foot lot cutback radius. Um, but on the right hand side of the screen, you have a, you have a 90 degree um, angle where the road connects with um, the other lot. But you do have a 30 foot pavement, whoops, sorry, uh, 30 foot pavement um, uh, angle. And this is something that we've discussed back and forth with DPW and the um, city engineer um, ad nauseum. Um, you know, this, this requirement developed many, many years ago when we were trying to be a different kind of community. Um, you know, um, we do keep the pavement at, at 15 degrees or at 30 degrees, but it doesn't meet the lot um, uh, setback um, for the radius. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, DPW and the city engineer have both said that we should not vary from that until the city standard is changed. Okay, thank you for that, Rob. Any other comments from board members? If not, we'll open up to the public. Oops, sorry, hang on, let me, I gotta stop sharing and... Um, So if there are attendees who would like to discuss, um, please, at the bottom of your screen, you should have a, um, a, uh, the ability to raise your hand. And uh, we'll recognize you if you have questions. So if anybody would like to speak, please raise your hand or ask questions now. We can also use the Q&A function uh, if you prefer to type your um, questions in there. And Madam Chair, I do not see anyone raising their hands at this time. Okay, so we'll uh, close the public portion of this. And would any other comments or does someone want to make a motion? Madam Chair, if I may, if you normally we accept the plan um, or reject the plan. And but if we accept the plan, we then go and do um, the waivers but the waiver is incorporated into the plan. So if, if you were going to reject the waiver, it is not possible to 
um, accept the plan. Does that make sense? Understood. Okay. A motion from a board member. Motion to deny. Second. Okay. All in favor to deny. Gary Hassan? Yes. James Sweeney? Yes. Tony Gonzalez? Yes. I'm sorry, Zoom. Thank you for your time. Tony, thank you very much. Okay. okay. Have a good night. All right. So, do don't we obviously don't need to discuss the waiver and nothing else is on the agenda. So, you're ready to make a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion to adjourn. Second that. All in favor? Yes. yes. Larry? Yes. Tim? Yes. yes. All right. Good night, Mr. May. Good